far we focused on applications of calorimetry where no physical or chemical change is happening. We just put a hot object inside the calorimeter and see what happens. Of course, calorimetry can be applied to chemical reactions just as well. And the basic idea here is we're going to think of the reactants and products of the chemical reaction as the system and everything else as the surroundings. Now, if our calorimeter is a well enough insulator and we're willing to make the approximation that it's a perfect insulator, we get a pretty simple heat balance out of this. We imagine that inside the calorimeter, for example, we have our reacting components, and I'm just going to represent those as a box, and that's our system. Let's label that with SYS to show that that's the system. Now, that's occurring in a solution involving a solvent and maybe some other unreactive components, for example, spectator ions. These are the surroundings. And this is it. This is our entire universe since the calorimeter walls are perfectly insulating by our assumptions. As a result of thinking of the system in this way, with the reacting components as the system and the solution as the surroundings, we get a heat balance where the heat absorbed or released by the reacting components is equal to the negative of the heat absorbed or released by the solution. And of course, if the reaction is releasing heat, the solution will absorb it and vice versa. Now, in the situation where the calorimeter walls are not perfectly insulating, which is, of course, what happens in real life, we need to include a term for the calorimeter, and that's going to go on the side of the solution. And so you may see this written <clears throat> in applications where we need a more exact answer or where the calorimeter is not as good an insulator as negative Q of the solution, which I'm going to abbreviate as S-O-L-N, plus a term for heat absorption or release by the calorimeter walls, Q cal. And here we're just adding a term for the calorimeter, and often this calorimeter term is expanded using the heat capacity of the calorimeter, which we know, often by direct measurement, something like C cal, the heat capacity of the calorimeter, times delta T cal, the change in temperature of the calorimeter walls. I only mention that because that's commonly included in practical applications of calorimetry and laboratory experiments in general chemistry where calorimetry is done, although it's not included here. And so just to reiterate this one more time, a key point with calorimetry of reactions and solution is to understand and visualize the system and surroundings appropriately. In a reaction occurring in solution, most of the molecules present are solvent molecules. And I'm just, I'll just represent the solvent, it's typically water, as kind of a blue background blob here. Within that solvent, there is a much smaller number of actual reacting molecules. And we might have, for example, at any given point in time, we might have some reactant molecules. I'll represent those in red. And we might have some product molecules, and I'll represent those in purple. Say the reaction is just some kind of rearrangement or, or something like that, where the red molecule is transforming into the purple molecule with the release or absorption of some heat. The system is only the reacting molecules, only the solute molecules, including the reactants and products. So we can imagine like an imaginary shell around the solute molecules, and this constitutes the chemical system. Everything else is the surroundings. The solvent, the calorimeter walls, any spectator ions, everything else is the surroundings. One of the reasons it's important to keep in, this in mind is because what we're typically measuring is the temperature of the solution which is part of the surroundings. And so in thinking about if you're measuring, if you're doing a calorimetry experiment and actually making a measurement with a thermometer, what am I actually measuring? It's the surroundings, not the system. Let's practice with some applications of calorimetry of reactions and solution. So let's imagine that we have 50 milliliters of one mole per liter hydrochloric acid in aqueous solution and an equal volume of one mole per liter sodium hydroxide solution, both at 22 degrees C. These are added to a coffee cup calorimeter 
and the reaction reaches a maximum temperature, the solution containing the HCl and sodium hydroxide reaches a maximum temperature of 28.9 degrees C. What we want to know is what is the approximate, approximate amount of heat produced by this reaction. Let's start by drawing a picture of the situation. We're going to assume that when we mix 50 milliliters of the HCl and 50 milliliters of the NaOH, we end up with a total solution volume of 100 milliliters. We have in the solution one molar hydrochloric acid. I'll just draw a few dots of hydrochloric acid to represent that. And we have one mole per liter of sodium hydroxide. And again, I'll just use a few dots to represent the hydroxide. And these are reacting, of course. So these are being consumed and forming products, sodium chloride and water. We actually don't need to know that in order to solve this problem, but it's worth reminding ourselves that when sodium hydroxide, which is a Bronsted base, combines with hydrochloric acid, which is a Bronsted acid, the molecular chemical equation looks like this, and we end up with dissolved sodium chloride, Na plus and Cl minus ions, and liquid water. The reason we don't need to know this is because we know the total solution volume. We have a rough measure of the mass of water in the solution, about 100 grams, and we know the temperature change. And this is enough to calculate a heat without reference to the reaction that's occurring at all. Remember, that temperature change refers to the temperature change of the solution, which is mostly water. So we can make a few assumptions that make our life a lot easier here. First, we can assume that the mass of the solution is pretty much entirely due to water and that it's essentially 100 grams because the mass contributions of HCl and NaOH molecules in each solution are quite small. The other assumption we can make is that the specific heat of the solution is equal to the specific heat of water. And we can do this because, again, the relatively small concentrations of HCl and NaOH are not going to push the specific heat profoundly far from the pure water value of 4.184 joules per gram degree C. We know the change in temperature from information given in the problem. That's 28.9 minus 22. That's 6.9 degrees C. And that is a delta T for the solution. And now we have everything we need to calculate Q of the solution. But before we do that, one thing we should do is think about the heat balance here. Now, the reaction is exothermic. Problem tells us that. What we can infer from that is that heat will be released by the reacting components and absorbed by the solution. And since the solution and the reacting components are all that's there that we're worrying about in the system, the heat that is released by the reaction solution is going to be equal to, but opposite in sign, the heat associated with the reaction. We're going to come back to that in a second after we calculate the heat of the solution. And all we're going to do for this is MC delta T. As we have determined above, I'm leaving out the subscripts to save a little bit of space. When we plug these numbers in, 100 grams times 6.9 degrees C times 4.184 joules per gram degree C, we end up with 2.9 times 10 to the third joules. Now, that's the heat of the solution. That's the heat transfer to the solution. What's the heat of reaction? Well, all we have to do to find that is to use this relationship and simply flip the sign. The heat of reaction here is negative 2.9 times 10 to the third joules, or if you like, negative 2.9 kilojoules. And that's it. So the key here was to recognize that we knew the total solution volume, total solution mass, made this key assumption that the solution is basically water. The mole fractions, for example, of HCl and NaOH are quite small in the grand scheme of things. And so we can assume that the 100 grams of water is what we're measuring. And 6.9 degrees C is a temperature change in 100 grams of water at the specific heat of water. We can calculate a heat from that, flip the sign to calculate the heat of reaction. This would be a little more complicated if we had to take into account 
the calorimeter walls. Generally in that case, although I won't go into detail here, you're going to assume that the calorimeter walls engage in the same temperature change that you've measured for the solution. So the 6.9 degrees C that we stipulated for the solution increase in temperature would also be assumed for the calorimeter walls, and we would use a previously measured calorimeter constant or heat capacity for the calorimeter walls to find the heat from that temperature change.